So what was your differential diagnosis? DVTPE. Right. Okay, DVTPE. Yeah. What else? <laughs> That's it. That's all I could have. Pneumothorax. All right, pneumothorax. Musculoskeletal. Okay, musculoskeletal chest pain. Hemothorax. All right, hemothorax. Dissecting aorta. Okay, aortic dissection. Awesome. Trauma to the left ventricle. Okay. Trauma, yeah. Someone maybe stabbed him in the left ventricle. Right. Hopefully on clinical physical exam. If we get to the point where where you're doing ultrasound to diagnose someone with a knife sticking out of their chest, we maybe have gone too far into the ultrasound range. That being said, actually, with people who have a lot of soft tissue and a lot of extra fat, and if it's a small knife and someone stabs them with it and then pulls it out. It's actually really hard sometimes to tell where that stab wound is because all the fat kind of goes around it. So if they've got a stab wound, especially to the right ventricle, um, which tends to be the one you can fix more commonly. So if they have a stab wound to the right ventricle, sometimes in, in those trauma patients, we're ultrasounding them just to find out if there's a, if there's, you know, a cardiac pericardial effusion and trying to decide, okay, do we have to crack open their chest and fix that right ventricle stab wound, um, which is not always as clinically obvious as if there's the knife that's still in there. But those little, po I mean, it's surprising. Those little pocket knives or something that's small enough that the fat kind of closes, you know, that you can see a little laceration there, but you won't necessarily know how deep it went. So mm -hmm. once in a while, we actually have to do it for those things. Well, you could have like a blunt trauma, right? Okay, yeah, I mean, blunt, yeah, I, yeah, blunt trauma, it's, yeah. The problem with blunt trauma, it, is it's if they have ma if they have massive cardiac trauma from blunt trauma it's much harder there's not much intervention you can, not as much intervention you can do kind of emergently if they have a stab wound and they have a laceration to the right ventricle you can open actually open their chest open the pericardium and stitch it up or staple it up and then if you fix that hole in the pair in the in the right heart you theoretically temporize the, the situation so you see anything different about the heart um, yes, theoretically. That gets into well into the advanced cardiac ultrasound. But yes, theoretically, if you have a blunt cardiac trauma, you can see signs on ultrasound. Um, you can see signs. You can see um, signs on EKG sometimes as well. And then you actually see signs of myocardial damage if you do labs and things like that. So what else? We've got pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, hemothorax. Musculoskeletal. Okay, yeah, so yeah, good, yeah. So maybe just good old-fashioned myocardial infarction. So how are you gonna, you know, in terms of thinking about risk stratifying those patients, a lot of those things can look pretty similar. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how ultrasound can help you break down some of those, okay, I, I think it's acute PE versus I think that they have an acute MI, or I think they have a tension pneumothorax. How do we, how do we use ultrasound to kind of help us decide those different things? Now. The problem with cardiac ultrasound is it, it can get very complicated. So you have echo techs who are essentially do, all they do is cardiac ultrasound. You have cardiologists who are board certified in reading echo. So you can get really complicated. We're gonna try to break it down and kind of go through a very simplistic but powerful algorithm to kind of help you sort through what would a PE look like versus what, what you expect to see if someone has acute MI and is now in now having heart failure, okay? So you think physiologically, we'll walk through how those things look different, okay? And how they affect the heart differently. And some of the stuff you've learned over the past couple weeks will, will come and in, play into that. So let's go through the views, right? So you guys watched the, kind of went through the, the four views, right? Everyone saw these, the, and the, the PowerPoint on the four different views, right? So why do we need four views? So what's, what's the advantage of having four different views of the heart? See different structures. Right, so the heart's three-dimensional, right? So anytime we're, we're ultrasounding the heart, we're trying to create a two-dimensional image that's moving of a three-dimensional structure. So what the, what the four different views allow us to do is look at different aspects of the heart. And what, that will come into play is in terms of what specifically our differential diagnosis is, what part of the heart we want to look at and how we would then refine our differential diagnosis. So we essentially have this view, which you've done before. So the subcostal or subxiphoid view. So that's this view here. So that is a good view to get a, a sense of kind of what the heart's doing overall. And you can usually get a sense of what's going on in all four chambers. So that's the subxiphoid view. 
Then we have the peristernal long axis view. That's what you did last year. So the peristernal long axis view gives us primarily a long axis view of the left ventricle. And then the peristernal short is really just a 90 degree turn on the left ventricle. So now we're getting a short axis of the left ventricle. And then apical four chamber view is gives, giving us a view of all four chambers. Okay, so those are our four views, essentially allowing us to look at it globally at the heart and then look at the left ventricle in more detail. Again, because the left ventricle is usually the business end of things that are going wrong. If you think about just all the pathophysiology of the heart, a lot of the pathophysiology is going to kind of revolve around the left ventricle. Not all of it, but a lot of it. So this is the subxiphoid view. You guys remember this from last year? Right, so probe here. Now, the problem with cardiac is that the cardiologist decided that they wanted the marker on the opposite side, which means if you're going subxiphoid, well, you've always said marker to the right. If you flip the marker to the opposite side, then you just have to flip the probe. So with your subxiphoid view, when you're doing in, when you're in cardiac modes, your probe marker, when you're in subxiphoid, is gonna to go towards the patient's left, okay? I apologize, it's just something that you have to get used to. When this is on the other side, you just flip the probe this way. So this subxiphoid view, which side of the heart is this? Right side of the heart, that's liver. liver, and then this is left side. Okay, so good global view, right side, left side. Okay, this is our peristernal long axis view. So in this view, we're getting a long axis of the heart. In this case, the probe marker is gonna to point towards the right shoulder, okay? So we've gone here, and then we're gonna point the probe towards the right shoulder. And then the nice thing about these three views is essentially your probe is just gonna rotate around the heart. So you're gonna start here, peristernal long axis, probe marker pointing towards the right shoulder. You're gonna to turn to short axis, probe to the left shoulder, and then you're gonna rotate another 90 degrees, probe to the left armpit, and that's your apical four. Now the apical, with the apical four view, you're gonna to have to slide down a little bit, but you just think about rotating the probe around a clock. So it starts here, you know, right around your probably, you know, 10 o'clock position, and then you're gonna to move to one o'clock, and then you're gonna to move to about mm -hmm three to four o'clock, and then you're gonna get the, the apical four. So you just think about rotating that probe around the heart. So this is our personal long. So what part, of, what part of the heart is this here? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so, so left ventricle. So what's this, what's this valve here? Mitral. mitral valve, okay. And then this is the left atrium, and then here's aortic valve right here. Okay, so we're getting a lot of left ventricle. So we, we gave, you gave me some differential diagnosis. If you're thinking about your differential diagnosis, which of the, of the things you listed, which, where do you really start caring about the left ventricle? Okay, so yeah, so acute heart failure, you know, acute cardiac activity, so they're having a big MI, what we might expect the left ventricle function to get worse, right? So if they have chronic heart failure, we might expect the left ventricle function to get worse. So some of these differential diagnoses, we're gonna really care about what the left ventricle is doing, okay? So that's long axis. In short axis, the left ventricle just looks like a donut because we're cutting through now in the short axis. The nice thing about this is we can see all, all the walls, right? So if an MI takes out the septal wall, I can see the septal wall and I can compare it to all the other walls. Now that's more advanced, but just it gives us a more global sense of the function of the LV, right? So that LV should contract symmetrically. So there's our peristernal long and short, really focusing on the LV. And then finally, our apical four chamber view coming down to really where you would normally feel the PMI. And you're gonna look at all four chambers. So which side of the heart is this here? So this is right, and then this is left. Now in a normal patient, which side should be bigger? Which ventricle? Okay, so this is a normal patient. So left ventricle should always be bigger than the right ventricle. Mm -hmm. And then the atria should be about the same size. So left and right atria should be about equal. Okay, so this is where we can compare chamber size. Left ventricle compared to right ventricle. Left atria compared to right atria. Okay, so if one of these is asymmetric, if the, if the right ventricle becomes bigger than the left ventricle, we know there's something going wrong. So far so good? Okay. So those are our four views. We're gonna talk about how they help us with basically three questions, okay? So there's a lot you can answer with ultrasound, but really, I want you guys to think about how you would answer these three questions. Is there a pericardial effusion? Yes or no? What is the LV function, good or bad? And what is the relative chamber size? So aortic dissection, that was one of our differential diagnoses. Why, so what's the problem with aortic dissection? What does it do? As far as the heart goes? 
Yeah, or? well, so, yeah, so as far as the heart goes, why do you, what is the, do you, did anyone tell you, did you guys talk about what the most common reason people die from aortic dissection is? Yeah, tamponade, right? So it dissects up, it can dissect things off. You can have strokes, you can start dissecting things off. The most common reason people die emergently from aortic dissection, it dissects backwards. And when it dissects backwards, it dissects into the coronary arteries, but it also dissects into the pericardium. And so you die, actually, a lot of the times you die from tamponade, which is you dissect back into the pericardium, you get a huge hemorrhagic pericardial effusion, and then you die from cardiac tamponade. Right, so that is the effusion part of, if I see a big pericardial effusion, I think about aortic dissection, then finding the effusion, even if I can't see the dissection, finding the effusion in a patient where I'm suspicious of dissection makes that differential much higher. Okay, and, it's, and especially because the effusion is usually the thing that's going to kill them. Okay, LV function, so we can think, we talked a little bit about why LV function will matter, and then relative chamber size. And we'll talk a little bit about why, if we see one chamber that's a little bit more dilated relative to the other ones, that would change our differential as well. Okay, so if I have our patient and they have some muffled heart tones and you see this EKG. Cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade. So what is this? Swinging. Swinging. What is this swinging? What is this called? Electrical. Electrical alternance, right? Alternance, yeah, average. But essentially what it happens is the QRS voltages are changing beat to beat, right? So voltage, the actual voltage of the QRS complex should be fixed, right? Because you shouldn't, your heart shouldn't change amp, electrical amplitude beat to beat. This means that the heart is moving in relation to your EKG leads, okay? So if we were looking at a heart like this, remember, three only three questions, effusion, function, chamber size. So do, does this patient have a pericardial effusion? What do you think? Fluid, there's black fluid around the heart, okay? Here's a little bit of a, here's a, so that's normal. That is, you guys see that? Pericardial effusion. This fluid is separating, so this is the descending thoracic aorta, right? The descending thoracic aorta goes behind the heart. If there's fluid that separates the heart from the aorta, see no fluid here? If there's fluid that separates those two, that fluid has to be in the pericardial space. So this is fluid. If my EKG lead is here, you can see how the electrical impulses from the LV get closer and farther away from the lead, why, that's why my EKG lead, the amplitudes are gonna change. Why does this kill you? Because the heart can't expand enough. Exactly, right? So what is the heart relies on being able to expand and contract in the pericardial space. So when you put pressure outside the, per, outside the myocardium, but in the pericardium, then the pressure differential inside the ventricles, right? That's how blood moves is changing pressure. But when I increase pressure here, then I can't, then I squeeze the heart down, the heart can't change pressure as easily. So then I die from basically hypoperfusion, right? Because I can't pump blood out of my heart if my heart's just squeezed down, okay? So this is really important to identify very early on. Very easy by ultrasound, looking for effusion. All right, so this is our IVC. So if we go back and look at our IVC, what would we expect if the pressures in the heart are high? What are we going to expect? What do we expect our IVC to look like? Dilated. dilated. Okay. So what's that a sign of? IVC dilated. Uh, right heart so, well, high right heart. It might not be right heart failure, but right high right sided pressures. So don't think about it as a disease process. Just think if this is high, then my pressure in my right ventricle and probably in my and certainly in my right atrium are definitely high as well. Okay, so did anyone, did you guys learn Beck's triad? So what's Beck's, does anyone remember? Hypotension, Hypotension JVD, and muffled heart tones. So you can imagine if I have fluid between my stethoscope and the heart, I have muffled heart tones. JVD, what is, JVD is a sign of what? Increased Increase, yeah, just increased central venous pressure, right? So we can see, we can see it here, but we can also see increased central venous pressure there. So if you have a pericardial effusion, you have high dilated IVC or dilated um, jugular vein, and you have someone who's hypotensive, that is tamponade, right? So you can see how ultrasound kind of, that Bex triad is, you can, you can do it clinically, but certainly by ultrasound, you can confirm that pericardial effusion. Okay. <clears throat> Let's say instead of we have, instead of someone who's hypotensive with muffled heart tones, we have someone who has now increasing dyspnea exertion, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, orthopnea, lower extremity swelling, they've got a new S3. 
So what's this? This is congestive heart failure, right? So this is the second part of our triad, effusion, function. And really when we're talking about function, we're talking about LV function. So that's normal. What do you think? Good or bad? Uh, All right, so you, what's normal ejection fraction? 65, 65, 65%, right? It doesn't, you don't have to type it in an exact ejection fraction. Just knowing the difference between normal and very low is very, is valuable, right? So if this is our guy's heart, this is pretty concerning that they've now got acute or probably acute or chronic congestive heart failure. Notice there's no fluid in the pericardial space. There's actually some fluid here in the thoracic space. How do I know it's thoracic? Well, it's sitting behind the aorta, right? So if it's sitting in front of the aorta, between the aorta and the heart, that's in the pericardial space. But just anatomically, anything behind the descending thoracic aorta is pleural space, okay? So function. The, L, the short axis view also really helps you here. So normal, you guys can see how well that contracts. Very low, okay? So this is our second algorithm, function. So if someone has acute CHF or they've had a big MI or some, another reason why they have got, you know, chronic hypertension with heart failure, you can pick up pretty, you know, you're not going to pick up subtle changes in EF, but massive changes in EF, you'll pick up pretty easily. Okay. So effusion function. The last one is relative chamber size. So let's say in, instead of an S3, we hear a split P2 and they've got systolic ejection murmur. So pulmon, pulmonic, right? So what, what would cause you to have a split P2 and a systolic ejection murmur. So you could have something in the pulmonary valve, right? So you have increased pressures usually in the pulmonic valve splitting the P2. So as you as you as your as your right ventricle uh, contracts and you have systole, you could have pulmonic pulmonic stenosis, not as common. Or what's the other valve on the right side that might? tricuspid, so tricuspid regurgitation, okay? So this is often a sign of high right-sided heart pressures, right? A fusion function relative chamber size. So if I show you this view, and I say this is the left ventricle here, what do you think? Relative chamber size, what's the RV relative to the LV? So massive, right? And you can see right atrium, really big as well, okay? So here's our relative chamber size. So where do you think the problem is in this case? In the lungs, for sure, right? Absolutely. How do you know it's in the lungs? Because the LV is fine, right? So you learn the most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure, right? But by ultrasound, if your left heart looks normal, then even though the most common cause is, is, is left heart failure, you can say definitively this is something going on in the lungs, right? So here in this case, we've got big RV, big right atrium, right? So this is something going on in the lungs. So what kinds of things could go in the lungs that would cause that problem? Pulmonary exactly, chronic, okay, awesome. Chronic pulmonary hypertension. In this case, this is probably chronic pulmonary hypertension. How, how do we know? The RV actually looks thickened, the RA is big and dilated, so this has been high pressures over a long period of time. If it was acute, what's the uh, disease process? You guys talked about it earlier. What's the acute disease process? P, okay, so acute PE. Both of them can cause this, right, which is tricuspid regurgitation. So is tricuspid regurgitation systolic or diastolic? Systolic, you should, but don't worry about remembering it, just think about it. As the RV contracts, it pushes blood backwards, right? RV contracts systole, you can see it physically pushing blood back into the, into the right atrium. Notice the right atrium relative to the left atrium is even more dilated, right? Relative chamber size. This is bigger because I'm increasing pressure due to that chronic tricuspid regurgitation. Okay, so you can hear it, you can definitely see it by ultrasound. Very common, when I see someone who has an isolated atrial enlargement, left or right, but the ventricles look normal, that's always, almost always a valvular problem, right? If an atria is abnormal, but the ventricles look fine, that means there's some type of regurgitation or stenosis that's caused pressures to go up just in that atria. A little bit more advanced, but just so you get a sense of how powerful this relative chamber size can be. But in our case, really what we care about is relative right versus left. So these are both right atrial dilations. This is chronic. Notice thickening, big right atrium. This is an acute PE. Notice the right ventricle is still big and dilated. Thinner though, the wall is thinner. Atria are about the same size, okay? You can kind of tell. I would not, you know, sell the farm on this, but just so you guys get a sense of, if you see the right ventricle dilated, that should 
and the left looks normal, that should be a sign I've got something going on in the lungs, either acute, something like a PE, or chronic, something like chronic, chronic pulmonary hypertension. So this is that's our algorithm. Effusion function relative chamber size. That helps you dramatically refine your differential. Are you gonna know for sure whether they're having acute MI or they have chronic heart failure? Maybe not, but you can kind of eliminate some of the other more common things. It's not cardiac tamponade, it's probably not a, a huge massive PE. And you can kind of say, these seem more likely based on kind of working my way through that algorithm. All right, one more thing, because we're gonna do a little bit of long as well. So let's say they have decreased breath sounds and you can't hear any breath sounds of the left lung. What's this? Pneumothorax, right? Okay, so you said that was a differential. So pneumothorax, so good lung markings, bad lung markings there, right? So ultrasound, actually, we can, you're gonna spend a little time looking at lungs today as well. So I'm gonna talk about this very briefly. But with, when you put an ultrasound on the lungs, you can actually see the ribs. So here's our ribs. You can see the pleural interface, and then you can see air-filled lung. Air-filled lung just reflects the ultrasound beam. So what, all you get is just kind of these repeating lines here. Now the advantage of it is the lung expands and contracts, right? Visceral and parietal pleural touching each other. As the lung moves, ultrasound's dynamic, you can see the two pleura moving in relation to each other. Can everyone see that a little bit here? Okay, so essentially there is, I get no information about this part here, right? Air-filled lung just looks like nothing, okay? You can see all, all these cases, here's my chest wall, here's my ribs. This just is kind of repeating reflections. Just like I was you know, shining a flashlight into a mirror. You just get a lot of reflection, but you get a lot of information right at the interface of these two pleura, this, this white line here. Everyone got that so far? As long as the pleura are moving in relation to each other, okay? What happens in this case? So what's this? Pneumothorax, Pneumothorax right? So this is CT scan slice. Collapsed lung, air-filled, not lung in this case, but thoracic cavity. Okay, air-filled lung in this case, right? The ultrasound, these two look exactly the same, right? Air-filled lung and air-filled lung or thoracic cavity look the same to ultrasound. The difference is the pleura touching, okay? So if we look at this side here and we put the ultrasound on, we should see the pleura moving in relation to each other, right? These, this pleura is moving in relation to that pleura. So it slides against each other and you can see that movement, ribs, ribs, chest wall, and I can see that pleura moving. In this case, if I put the ultrasound probe here, what if I look at that pleural line, it's static, exactly, right? Can everyone see the difference? It looks, this part looks very similar, okay? But this is actually not moving. See the white line here? That one's moving, that one's not. So far so good? So this is pneumothorax. The rest of it looks the same. It's just about the dynamic movement. Okay, so what happens if I put the ultrasound probe right there? No, pneumothorax, no, no. What do you think is gonna to happen to the lung? So you're gonna see lung moving, no lung moving. Okay, this is a really good illustration of, this is where the lung is moving in relation to the two pleural touching. This is where the pleura, this is right here. The pleura aren't touching on this side of the ultrasound probe, the pleura are. Never see the difference there? It's subtle, but just giving you a sense of looking at the lung moving dynamically really helps you decide, is there, is there, any, is there any air in between my ultrasound probe and the two pleural layers, okay? The problem is that all of this looks the same, so you really just have to look at that pleural line. So you wouldn't be able to see the other pleural line? No, like no, that's the, tr that's the, that's the challenging part, because remember, ultrasound, Air reflects the ultrasound beam, so, so this is what this is where this is what what gets really confusing, and everyone gets confused about this. But if you think about, it, which is normal, is just, if you think about this, the, the ultrasound beam just sees this as air. Mm -hmm. The ultrasound sound beam sees this as air. It can't see through the air, so it can't see the other pleural line. Yeah. Now, if this is all fluid, mm -hmm. if this is a hemothorax, then you can actually see the lung below it. But if it's air, it just sees air. Okay. So the real problem is it sees these two as exactly the same. It's only the pleural interface that's different. That's what stinks about this, but actually what is cool as well because it's so dynamic. All right, so that's our, those are our basic ultrasound views, all right? And that's kind of how you can go from, do they have a pneumothorax or do they have a PE? Just one last word about murmurs because I just think this is 
you know, as you think about ultrasound, right, you learned the murmur. So which murmur do you think this is? Nordics. So this is apical four chamber view. So this is, yeah, mitral valve. So it could be, yeah, you could see it, but the blood's going back into the, so it might probably mitral regurgitation. So mitral regurgitation is systolic or diastolic? Olo systolic. You don't have to memorize it. Just if you look at the LV, as it contracts, it's pushing blood backwards, right? So just don't worry about memorizing which murmur goes with which systole or diastole. Just in your brain, there's so much to memorize. If you can use physiology to your advantage, go for it, right? So I just think about like, okay, as blood is getting pushed out, it's getting pushed out of the aortic valve. So aortic stenosis is systolic. It's getting pushed back through the mitral valve. So mitral regurg is systolic, right? So as opposed to, what murmur is this? So we're in peristernal long, that's mitral valve. What valve? Okay, so aortic, but which way is it going? Backwards, so which one's that? Aortic regurg, okay, so aortic regurgitation, systolic or diastolic? Diastolic, right, because guess what? As the LV relaxes, it's supposed to be sucking blood this way, but now it's sucking blood back from the, the aortic valve, right? So this is a diastolic murmur. So just kind of a cool, I think ultrasound really just illustrates the point of, you know, the physiology as the LV relaxes, that's when you get air regurgitation. That's also when blood comes in from the mitral valve, right? So that's mitral stenosis. So if you think physiologically, you don't have to memorize as many of those tables. I remember in med school, I would just write it, like AS, you know, and do that. But if you just remember the physiology, you don't have to do as much memorization. All right, questions at all about that? All right. So go ahead and go do some ultrasound, enjoy, and please let me know if you have any other questions.